Well, this is a picture of me about six months after I got taken. Um, not very flattering. And uh, I called it the Vista years. While most of you were battling with Windows Vista, um, that was the least of my worries. <laughs> um, so here's my story, really. Um, oh, yeah. So I'm from Lincoln, which is in the north, for all of you in the south. <laughs> um, I grew up there, went to school there, went to scouts there, went to venture scouts there, did all, the, all that sort of stuff. Um, and it was during that time I went to university at Nottingham, did a bachelor's degree in information technology, and then went to Norwich and did a master's degree in computer science. And during this time at university, um, I sort of developed this notion of working overseas in international development. Um, so following my master's degree, um, my first country I went to was China, and I did two years there, and it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. I went over there, I worked in a university, I was teaching computer science, I was teaching programming, uh, and I did all the great stuff, you know, I met Chairman Mao, I used chopsticks, you know, yeah, saw panda bears, you know, all, all the great stuff. Um, and I went back to England after my two years with the intention of settling down, getting a nine-to-five job, all that sort of thing. Uh, I think I was probably back in England, you know, for like a, a month or something. And uh, actually, I realized that I wanted to go overseas again. So I started looking for other work. And initially, I was offered a job um, with an international volunteering position with an organization called VSO, Voluntary Services Overseas. And what they did was, was they put international volunteers in to developing countries for two years. And I was offered three places, Eritrea, South Africa, and Guyana. Eritrea and South Africa I had heard of. I could see them on a map. I knew where they were. Guyana, I thought, was in Africa. <laughs> Couldn't see it on the map. Did a bit of Googling around. Turned out it was politically part of the Caribbean. All sorts of images went through my mind. You know, white sand, blue sea, all that kind of thing. Um, so I took the Guyana job. Um, when I then realized it was actually part of South America. So I thought, well, that's no problem, because um, with a bit of luck, I'll be able to learn Spanish, maybe even Portuguese. What I didn't know, it was the only English-speaking country in South America. Um, I didn't even know there was an English-speaking country in South America. Um, so anyway, I went there, um, and I was working on databases. I was working for the land department, the equivalent of their ordnance survey. And the job was to map data, and we put it into a database, we used GIS, geographical information systems, all that sort of thing. And it was great, I got to travel around the whole country. The country is the size of England, 90% uninhabited, only 750,000 people live there, and so I got to travel to great areas of the interior, see loads of rainforest. This is um, Kaichur Falls, which is the sing largest single drop waterfall in the world, right in the middle of nowhere, um, absolutely amazing. So, I did my two years volunteering, and then I was asked to stay on for a further year, which I did, and I ended up working in the Mining Commission, dealing with uh, gold mining is quite big out there, so dealing with the mapping of gold mining and the regulation of it. During this time, things get move on. Reality is, you know, I've got the student loans to pay, volunteering is good for the soul, not very good for the bank account. So I start looking for other work. And I see an advert, uh, to this day, I, when I read the advert, I'm sure it said computer people in the islands. It's strange what you think. I applied, and someone called me back from Iraq. I looked back at that advert. It said, yeah, computer people in Iraq. I was like, Ugh, don't remember it like that. Anyway. So I thought about it a lot. And, um, you know, I sort of started to justify to myself why it would be a good reason to go to Iraq in 2007. So first of all, it was not a military job. It was training local IT staff. I'd been doing that in Guyana, training local IT staff. So that was, that was quite handy. I'd had a lot of experience of that. Um, I said I needed to clear the student loans. You know, this, was a, this wasn't a consultancy, I should explain. I was a direct employee. It was a direct employee position working out of DC. And um, the salary was pretty good. For some reason, I'd convinced myself that I wanted post-conflict experience. Uh, I don't really know where that came from. Um, but... I still don't have that. What I have is in conflict experience. So, uh, you know, never got that. And, you know, I work in international development because I want to make a difference. I want to try and improve the lives of people, make things less corrupt and all that sort of stuff. I've never been to the Middle East. Good opportunity to learn new language, try new food, all that sort of stuff. But the thing that really clinched it, I was playing this stupid game with my friends. Um, <laughs> 
So we have this game where you have to live and work in every country, beginning with a letter of the alphabet. So like A is Australia, B is Belgium, C, Canada, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and at the time, there was no country beginning with the letter W. West Germany didn't exist, Western Samoa didn't exist, all that sort of thing. So I raised the question of, if I went to Iraq, which was a war zone, would I get W for war zone? Okay. They said, if you're stupid enough to go to Iraq, and something goes wrong, and you talk about Guyana after you get released, they'll give me the W. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I still talk to those friends. Um, annoyingly, they disqualified me for taking the game too seriously. Anyway. So, um, I was employed by a company called Bearing Point. Uh, I should point out, for the legal aspect of this, that um, there is a company that headquarters in London right now called Bearing Point using the same logo as my company. Um, in 2009, the company went bankrupt, and London office bought out the European division of Bearing Point and got the rights to the logos and all that sort of thing. So, just to cover the legal aspects of it, I, don't, I was, had no association with the London company, and they don't have any association with this. Okay. Um, but at the time, Bearing Point was based, headqu well, its headquarters was in Washington, D.C., and they specialized in emerging markets or developing countries. Uh, they had offices worldwide. I'd come across them in Guyana. They're in the Caribbean, Asia, Europe, as I say, uh, operating in Africa, all sorts of stuff. What I didn't know, of course, until I got to Iraq, was that they also provide staff to the CIA. <laughs> um, didn't know that. Uh, and they went bankrupt in 2009, unbeknown to me at the time. So what was I doing? My work was within the Ministry of Finance Data Center. Now, that was based in the University of Baghdad, not the big sort of Ministry of Finance building you see on the news that keeps being blowing up all the time. Um, it was in the red zone, and I lived in the green zone. Now, naively, before I went, I thought there'd be a green zone, a yellow zone, an orange zone, a red zone. You know, there'd be a bit of shading, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, no, it was like this really small bit of green in the center of Baghdad, and the rest of the country was red. <laughs> um, not good. <laughs> yeah. um, so initially, my job was to develop reports from the Financial Management Information System, the FMIS. What had happened was that... Um, the USA, the American government, had funded this database system and no reports were coming from it. So they'd sent me out to get reports on how the Iraqi government was spending money. Didn't, don't see anything wrong with that picture. Um, the, there was some other work, uh, government employee census database. So in developing countries, you get a lot of phantom employees. So someone will be a teacher and also a police officer and they'll claim double salary but only do one job. It's illegal, it's corruption, you're not supposed to do it. Um, so the aim of the game was to filter out these phantom employees and create a government census database. You kind of get it in England where a director will put their wife on the payroll uh, in order to reduce the tax payments even though the wife never turns up to the company. It, it is illegal to do it. Um, but, you know, I guess murder is illegal, right? But it still happens. So, yeah. um, okay, I took this picture. I don't know why I took this picture of my room um, in Iraq before my abduction, um, it's poor quality because it was taken on film, right? You, I don't know if you remember the, back, the, the old days back then, before digital. Um, but more importantly, this is my body armor. And you see that huge 13, body armor number 13, right? And uh, it was right on my chest here. And they said to me, you could black that out. And I thought, I'm not going to do that. Having 13 on your body armor, that's got to be lucky, right? That's got to be a lucky sign right there. Maybe it was, I don't know. So, I've been in Iraq at this point just under two months. I'd spent most of that time in the green zone, getting my permit to travel to the red zone. Um, May the 29th, 2007, it was about 11 o'clock. Uh, I was doing a training session in a room with a whole load of Iraqi programmers. We were looking at ways in which we can report from a database. Very mundane, technologically not very, very advanced. All of a sudden, I hear someone shout, get down. Everyone in my room stands up. Okay, now I know from working internationally, you don't be the odd one out. So I also stood up to blend in. <laughs> Unfortunately, when I stood up, it put me right next to the door. Next thing that happens, door opens, there's a police officer from the Ministry of Interior there. Now in, in Iraq, each ministry has their own police force. This guy's from the Ministry of Interior, it's responsible for uh, internal kind of government processes. 
I look at him, he looks at me, I look at him, puts a gun straight to my head. <laughs> I think I laughed, I think it was my initial reaction. But what I remember most about it was not the gun pointing at my face. What I remember was he had a machine gun slung over his arm. And the barrel of the machine gun was pointing right at my groin. And I just remember thinking, this machine gun fires, this is really going to hurt. <laughs> so I, I just put my hands up and uh, he said, come on. So I thought we were under arrest. I didn't think this was an abduction at all. I thought we was under arrest. I step outside. I expect to see my four British guards. They're not there. The place is overrun by Iraqi police. I'm led to the entrance to the Ministry of Finance building, and I see the team leader of my security team being beaten up by about five Iraqis. I'm stood there with my hands up. I said to him, what do I do? He said, just do whatever they say. And I remember thinking, that's rubbish. You're the security team. You're supposed to kung fu kick your way out of this. Like, what a useless advice is that? Um, with that, they led me out of the building and into the back of a police vehicle. There was about 20 police vehicles all lined up. And we drove off, lights and sirens going. Um, they missed one person. There was another IT guy in the room next door. For some reason, they missed him. And after we got taken, they hid him in the false floor of the computer room. Uh, which was quite interesting. I actually emailed him when I got out. I asked him if he bought a lottery ticket that day. Um, and that's our WikiLeaks entry, which interestingly, you can't actually access in the UK. I tried getting it a couple of days ago. It's very bizarre. Anyway, so these are the four guards that were captured with me. Um, this guy here was the team leader. I was with him for six months. Um, we were sort of chained together like this far apart. And it very quickly became apparent we didn't actually have a lot in common. Um, yeah, it's tough, right? Yeah, we, we actually had, uh, I remember, I can't even remember what we argued over one day. It was something really stupid, like, uh, you know, the color of this desk. I said it was black, and he said it was dark gray. I was like, no, it's black. No, it's dark gray. I was like, right, I'm not talking to you anymore then, okay? Right. Yeah, we're sleeping this far apart from our faces. So we didn't talk for two days. Now, I knew I could hold out. I'm an IT guy. I'm used to sitting in a basement on my own, right? So <laughs> two days later, this guy just turns to me and says, I can't do it anymore. I've got to talk. I was like, I knew you'd break. I knew you couldn't do that. So anyway, I w I'd like to always say that these were great guys. You know, I got on really well with them. I knew them well. The reality is I'd never met them before. I didn't know them at all until this day. Um, and they were all killed. Um, I, know, I never saw them after the first six months. So this sort of timeline that we went through. So the first day, we put into the back of this police vehicle and we drive off. Still don't know I'm being abducted at this point. And um, they start, I've got an Iraqi next to me, the team leaders in the back of this car with a few Iraqi police officers, and we're going along. And I remember in my pocket, I had 400 US dollars. Now in South America, 400 US dollars gets you out of a lot of trouble if you pay the police. And I remember I passed it to the Iraqi police officer in the front seat, and I said, dollar. And he looked at it, and he threw it out the window. And that's when I thought, this is an abduction. This is not good. With that, they started taking my shirt off. They passed it to the guy in the front, threw it out the window. I was wearing steel toe cap boots. They took them off, threw them out the window. And I remember thinking, ooh, hope that didn't hit anybody. <laughs> that's really going to hurt. Um, we were then transported all the way down to a place called Sadar City, which is the slum area of Baghdad. We were taken out of that police vehicle. And we were all in our underpants. There's five of us stood in our underpants in the middle of this Iraqi market. Another vehicle pulls up like a minibus. We put into the back of that, and we're driven off. Two Iraqis are in the back with us. And one of them's wearing an American military uniform. It's a translator. I could see the TS on his arm translation services. And he looked familiar. He looked like a brother of an Iraqi that I'd worked with. And I, I turned to him. I said, do you speak English? And he said, no. <laughs> right. As we're driving along, they show us their ID card, and it's clearly Ministry of Interior Police. Ah, great. You know. um, we get taken out of the vehicle, and we, we're put into this room. And uh, we're, this, I get blindfolded. The other four are already blindfolded, and then I get blindfolded. And one of the British guards, I thought he'd broke his shoulder. That wasn't the case, but I thought that's what had happened. And he's in a lot of pain. He's handcuffed behind his back, and they hear him like, ah, ah, ah. And um, there's a bit of a debate going on amongst us all, like, what's going on? Is this an abduction? Are we under arrest? What's happening? And with that, I hear them pick up the guy who I thought had got this broken shoulder. I can hear him walk out, and there's a gunshot. Big debate. What just happened? 
have they just executed this guy? I'm still processing this. Like, what does this mean? What happened? When they picked me up, walked me out, walked me halfway down the stairs, and there's a gunshot. It was a scare tactic. It was just to frighten us. And it worked. Right? Um, I get put in another vehicle, get transported for only maybe five minutes. At this point, we're only probably 20 minutes into the abduction. Very, very fast. We've already gone through three vehicles. Um, and I get put into like a basement of a farmhouse or something like that. We're there for like half an hour, get food, get water. And then I get put into a false compartment of a Bedford truck. So I've got my back to the wall of this Bedford truck with the knees up to my chest. I've got a British guy with his back on my knees and then the third British guy sat with his back to the wall with his knees facing out. And they seal up the secret compartment and they drive off. It was really narrow. I remember it was less than my shoulder's width. I was sat like this, handcuffed. And I very bravely kind of picked up my blindfold. And I could see the sunlight through cracks in the welds in this truck. And I looked around at this false compartment. There was no way out of this. And I just remember thinking, this would never happen to Indiana Jones. He'd be out of this by now. Yeah. Um, we get, we're in this truck for two days. We eventually get transported all over the place, very rough ground. Um, we end up down in, in Basra, in the southern part of Iraq. Taken out the truck, put into a car, driven off, only five minutes, blindfolds taken off. I'm stood there in a room with the other two British guards. Bit of a conversation, yes, I came down with the other two, we were all together. Everyone thinks we're in Basra. So basically for the first six months of 2007, the British guards get split into two groups of two, and I keep getting moved between those two groups. I can see we're all alive, everyone's okay, we're only about five minutes from each other, we're all all right. In July of 2007, I get transferred up to Hiller, along with the, the team leader of our British team. We're there for a few months. We're constantly being told we're going to be released in an exchange deal and that negotiations are going on. In November, we get returned back to Basra. Nothing's happened. Um, and in December, I get separated off from the other British people. I, that's the last time I see them. In 2008, I'm in a house. I'm with these two Americans, these guys here. A guy called Sergeant El Tai. This guy's Michael Chand. This guy was the only American to be classified missing in action. Um, felt a bit sorry for him, really. He, um, his family had left the Iraq under the Saddam regime, and then when it got overthrown by the Americans, he came back as a translator for the American army and then got captured by Shia. So he kind of left under one regime and got captured by the other. Um, these were also killed. Um, their bodies got released, I think, 2010. Um, so, yeah, so I was with these guys for six months, and then in June of 2008, I get moved up to Baghdad, I get separated off, I move to Baghdad, I don't see any other foreigners again. Um, and in 2009, I'm held back with the Ministry of Interior Police who, uh, who took me in the first place. So, treatment-wise, um, I always say 2007 was harsh, and necessarily harsh. Uh, all sorts of stuff, I had got beaten, we was chained up, blindfolded, handcuffed, I got glass smashed in my leg, uh, broke my rib, uh, again, it had already broken once when I got put in the false compartment of the truck. Um, it, was, it was rough. I think it was pretty harsh. 2008 was better. I was blindfolded more, um, and I had to lay down for about six months. I wasn't allowed to sit up other than to eat. But I was in the room on my own with the, with the Iraqis, so I was able to start building a bit of a rapport and start talking to them about things. Um, and then I got separated from everyone, and I got moved away. And I was really able to start building a rapport then. I was able, when I got moved to a new place, I had new guards. And I was able to say, why are you blindfolding me? The other people didn't blindfold me. So I was able to build, build up rights like that. And 2009, in comparison to what we're talking about, was actually pretty good. I got a PlayStation, had a laptop, got to exercise, got off the chains, got the blindfold off. That was great. And of course, ultimately, I got released, which was very nice. So generally getting through the day, primary aim of the day was to survive it. So when I got captured, every day I lived, I felt was one day closer to the day of release. But I re in reality, that gap did not get any less. And as time went on, it just went on and on and on. Um, I did try to keep track of the date. And I was actually pretty good at that. Um, I managed to hold on to the date for a year. And when they took the blindfold off, I was one day out. I know where I lost that. It was in March of 2008. Um, what had happened was I was down in Basra. 
and the British had pulled out and the militia had taken over the city of Basra and the Americans had decided to take it back. So they came in and I just woke up one morning, the building was shaking, there was bombs going off, missiles, everything. I couldn't believe it. I could hear whizzes of bullets past the window and it was the Americans coming in to move the militia out. Um, they transferred me out of that house that day and that's when I lost that, that date. Um, I tried to improve my immediate surroundings. As I say, every time I moved, I got this new set of guards. So I was really able to sort of play on things. Um, I got to a point where I had a TV, I had a PlayStation, laptop, you know, ensuite toilet, all this sort of stuff. Um, and and that, I, I ultimately got quite good conditions under the circumstances. Um, I tried to cost the militia as much money as possible. Um, you know, I used to shower in shampoo because it was more expensive. The reality was what I was trying to do was create this paper trail. They kept accounts, right? But what I realized once I got released was this militia was getting millions and millions of dollars. You know, my little sort of one pound 50 piece of shampoo didn't really show up on that radar very much. Um, I used to try and leave DNA evidence in the room. So I was concerned that maybe the Americans or the British might come into the room after I'd been moved out. So what I used to do was peel skin off my feet and flick it around the room to try and leave bits of skin around. And I used to talk to the militia to try and find out as much information about them as possible. Are they married? Do they have children? All this sort of thing. Um, yeah, mental stimulation. I used to do mathematical formulas, work out pyramids in the shapes on the curtains, try and keep the mosquito kill ratio up to five mosquitoes a day. That's really difficult when you're handcuffed and blindfolded. You're trying to, like, you know, kill mosquitoes like that. Yeah, one lands on your forehead and you sort of... <laughs> oh, <ow. laughs> um, and I used to try and increase the size of this fluff ball. I used to pull fluff off my, uh, off my shirt. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, I used to wind it into a ball. And it was great until I had this ball that was like this big. And the militia got suspicious. So they came in one day and started ripping it up and threw it away. And I felt really sad about that. So at that point, I realized I was not going to have any emotional attachment to anything I had ever again. So every month, I would start to ask for new clothes and all that sort of thing. Because I was already in a bad situation. So I didn't want to feel sad more sad as a result of things I, I was doing. Um, and I used to talk to my pillow, you know, when I was on my own. I felt that if I could hold an interview or negotiate a motorcycle sale with my pillow, that was keeping my mind active. I thought, you know, they can damage me physically and that can be repaired. But as long as I keep my mind active, I'll be able to work again once I get out. And talking about my wife, yeah, the wife thing. Okay, so when we first got taken hostage, the four British guards, we were all in a line. It was me, the four British guards. The Iraqis asked us, are we married? The four British guards said, yes, they were married. Okay, and I remember thinking at that time, I can see the outcome of when you say, yes, you're married. Everything's okay. What I don't know is, what happens if I say, no, I'm not married. I don't, I don't want to be first in the head slicing stakes. So I said I was married, right? I mean, you know. I didn't expect to have to hold this story for two and a half years and build on it. So, you know, I mean, what do you do? I've said yes. So later down the line, they want to know the name of my wife, what she does, and all this sort of stuff. What, what, do, you do, what do I do? Oh, when I said yes, I'm married, I meant no, I'm not. Um, so, yeah, I've got to run with it. So I thought about, well, I've got, I've got, I can't choose anyone British to start with. That's far too traceable. So I thought about, you know, my girlfriends that I had in Guyana. I'm a programmer. That pool is really damn small, right? <laughs> so I thought about my friend's ex-girlfriends in Guyana. So I based it on, on one of them. And, uh, you know, I said she was a malaria doctor. Her name was Emma D'Souza. Ah, I came up with this whole story about my wife. And in order to keep the, the lie alive, I guess, I used to tell the different militia different parts of the story. So if they ever got together, they'd have, it wasn't just repeated parrot fashion. So I don't, I don't know what the art of telling a good lie is. I don't, I don't, I don't know, but I seem to pull it off. And um, again, I tried to demonstrate religious empathy. So when we were taken hostage, they asked me what religion was I. So I said I was Protestant, but they didn't understand the word. So they said to me, is that Catholic? I said, yeah, that's Catholic. Same thing, right? And there's a whole ensemble of story about having to go with this Catholic thing. So... At first, I realized that I've got to do some Catholic stuff, right? I've got to look like I'm Catholic. So I thought, you know what? I'm, before I go to sleep, I better pretend I'm praying. And then I thought, well, I've got to be consistent with my time. So I just thought, one, two, three. And then I thought, you know what? I may as well pray, because praying is better than wishing and hoping. Over time, 
they, they come in one day with these Islamic prayer beads. And they say to me, look, we're really sorry. We can't get Catholic prayer beads. We've got these Islamic ones. Is that okay? So I thought, yeah, that's fine. I can work with that. So I used to sit here flicking these prayer beads. It was quite therapeutic. In my mind, one banana, two banana, three banana, four. Right. One day, this guy comes in, speaks quite good English. He says to me, uh, as a Catholic person, what do you say? I was a bit like, huh? <laughs> um, so I said, um, well, you say you're Hail Marys. Right? I always thought it was a bit weird, right? Brings over this laptop, English Arabic translation software. I put it in, Hail Mary. H-E-L-L space M-A-R-Y. <laughs> Pressed enter, nothing found. Fortunately, it's got alternative words. Oh, they say Hail Mary. <laughs> okay, uh, that sounds better. Understand that a bit more. So... How hard can it be? One Hail Mary, two Hail Mary. I mean, that's easy. I click this link. It's this massive prayer. And I thought, I can't lie anymore. I have no idea what this, what this is about. So um, I thought, I'm just going to take the beat in here. I'm just going to say it. I, I don't know. So what I said to him, I said, look, you know, I, I've got to be honest with you. I learned this prayer when I was a baby. I don't know it. I've been saying the wrong thing. I'm really sorry. Yeah, I thought it was going to give me a bit of grief. He said to me, not a problem. Because under Islam, God recognizes what you do, not what you say. I was like, whoa, great, fantastic. <laughs> what I realized at the end, of course, is that we, we started having conversations about the difference between Islam and, and sort of Catholicism. And what I realized was that actually what we were talking about was my complete misinterpretation of Catholicism versus their strict interpretation of Islam. Anyway, um, so as time goes on, I'm starting to think, is this going to end? I mean, we're talking years now down the line. And these, these are all my possibilities that I thought about. Release seemed unlikely. Rescue, you know, the first six months of being held, I thought, yeah, you know, special forces are going to come storming in at any moment and rescue us all. That didn't happen. Escape was looking really unlikely. Um, I was on my own. I was chained up. I was getting weak. I couldn't, I couldn't move. So I thought I was going to die. So the question was, how was I going to die? When was I going to die? Um, execution sounded rough, all right? Now, I, I remember when we first got taken, we said six months, dead or alive, this thing's going to be over. Six months in Iraq as a hostage was a long time. At about six and a half month mark, a police sergeant from the Ministry of Transport comes in, blindfolds me, handcuffs me behind my back, takes me off the chains, kneels me down, puts a gun to my head, and I'm thinking, what's going on? And there's a click. And then there's a bang. And I remember sitting there thinking, I'm dead. They just shot me in the head. And then there was a bit of reality of, no, 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 hold on, get a grip. You know, I can hear people laughing. I'm still alive. I'm not dead. And I remember they sort of led me back in the room, and the British guy that was with me said, what happened? I said, I don't know. I think they just shot me in the head. And uh, I remember thinking that if I was ever going to be executed, I was going to show no fear you know, stiff British upper lip and all that. Put the gun to my head, they clicked it, there was a bang, everything went black and white, I started shaking, sweating, never experienced anything like it at all. So that whole execution concept didn't really appeal to me very much. All right. um, so the next thing is, I thought, well, maybe I was going to die from sickness. I had been really sick, I'd had dysentery, they'd got a doctor in to try and sort me out. Um, that's tough. You know, I'm chained to a grill in a wall with less than a metre of chain, handcuffed, blindfolded, can only go to the toilet twice a day, you've got dysentery, something's got to give, it's not good. Um, so, we get on to suicide. Two years down the line, I eventually get off the chain, and they put the chain on a shelf in a cupboard near to where I was staying. And in the roof was a hook that had a chandelier on it. I knew the hook was strong. They used to put a bar through it and do chin-ups on this bar. So I thought it'd be quite fitting to hang myself with the chain on that hook. And I really sort of psyched myself up for it. The, the reason for it primarily was I could choose how I die, when I die, rather than being dragged out and beaten, whatever. So I really thought about why I wanted to do it. And in actual fact, the only reason I wanted to commit suicide was I just wanted to see the reaction of the, the Iraqi guards when they walked in and saw me hanging there. I knew they'd be in big trouble. Now I've got a dilemma. Obviously, if I've hanged myself, I'm guessing you can't see anything. Don't know, but I'm assuming that's the way it works. Um, so now I'm really annoyed, 
because I can't achieve what I want to achieve. I can't hang myself and see their reaction. So now I've got to roll it all back. And it was at that point that I thought, right, I'm going to make this out alive. Stubbornness is kicking in. I am going to survive this. And if they're going to kill me, it's through their choice and not through anything I did wrong. So time goes on. And May 2009, I've been held for two years at this point. This guy comes to see me. He tells me that everyone's dead. Um, I'm the only survivor. And that if I don't try and escape and no rescue attempt is made, they'll release me for his brother. He's the number one commander of a militia called uh, a Seabell Hack. I wasn't convinced, to be honest with you, but I wasn't really in a very good position to argue it. So I thought, you know, there's no way they're going to exchange me, an IT guy, for the leader of a militia. In September 2009, they released another body of a British guard for 100 live militants. To this day, I say that was a bad deal, and whoever negotiated that should have been dismissed. The reason is, it's set a value. It says that one British dead person is worth 100 live local militia. I don't think that's very good. So, December 2009, I'm watching Baghdad TV. And this really weird kind of CCTV thing is on the Baghdad news. And this vehicle pulls up, and this guy gets out. Guy, well, I didn't know at the time, but it's this guy, Case El Kasali. And I remember the militia saying to me something about, that's American military. I said, that's not military vehicle, that's diplomatic. You know, it just looked weird. Didn't think too much of it. Two days later, so this is 30th of December 2009, so now it's two years, seven months, and one day after I've been captured, or 946 days, depending on which one sounds better. A guy comes in at like four o'clock in the morning, it's still dark, gives me a kick, tells me to get up, I'm being released. I didn't believe him. They've been telling me I'm going to be released for every couple of months. So I just like go away. It's four o'clock in the morning, leave me alone. I want to go back to sleep. So another guy comes in, it speaks better English. He says to me, you've got to go, you've got to go to the British Embassy, you're being released. So I said, why? Why am I being released? <laughs> He said, because our leader's been handed over. You've got to go. He said, look, we've bought your new clothes. Get up, cut your hair, have a shower. So I'm like, right, fine, whatever. <laughs> I didn't believe it. I thought at best this militia had probably captured, um, had a fight with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda had maybe captured some of their militia and they were going to exchange me with Al-Qaeda, which in the sequence of organizations would have been better because I had uh, a big company behind me, unbeknown had gone bankrupt, um, that could pay my ransom. But anyway. So I go through the motions, I have to write this statement, you know, I get all these clothes, um, they want to know my wife's name, wife's address, what she does, all that sort of thing, um, father's name, all this sort of stuff. And then they, they blindfold me and leave me out. Now, no one's particularly excited. I've been with some of these Iraqis for nearly two years, and they're not very excited about it at all. Um, so I was really sceptical. Take me downstairs, put me into the back of a vehicle, we drive off a little bit, take the blindfold off, two people in the front of this car. There's a driver and there's a guy with a video camera. He turns around to film me. It's the very same guy that took me hostage, the guy that pointed the machine gun at my groin. I'm like, great, nice touch, you know? <laughs> guy that took me, this guy's going to release me. We drive through Baghdad, maybe only 15 minutes drive, not, not long at all. And I'm taking out the vehicle and I walk into this long room, uh, maybe five meters wide, I don't know, 20, 30 meters long. And it's full of people. There's nothing else in the room, just full of people. Half of them are wearing like militia kind of military gear with big guns. The other half are in normal clothes. They've all got cameras and all this sort of thing. At the end of the room is a sofa. And this guy in the suit is sat on it. He gets up, he comes over to me, says, Peter Moore, he says, yes. He says, my name's Sami al Askari. Okay. He says, I'm with the Iraqi government. I just remember thinking, my situation's not improved. I've just spent two and a half years with the Iraqi police. Like, you know, I don't feel any better. Um, he sits back on the sofa. I sit next to him. He makes a statement to camera. I make a statement saying how good the militia's been. You know, I'll give you five stars on TripAdvisor. Can't wait to return. All that kind of thing. Um, and with that, he gets up and goes out. Um, Got to move on. Time's running out. So, yeah. So, okay. So, I get out. We get into this car. This guy's sat next to me. He's on the phone. Yeah, with him now. Da, da, da. We'll be at the, the, we'll, we're heading there now. Puts the phone down. Says to me that was the British Embassy. I thought, no way. If that was the Embassy, they'd want to talk to me. We drive along. Go through some blast walls. Car stops. I get out. This guy walks up to me in a pink shirt. Says, hello. <laughs> this is the British Embassy. I'm here to take you home. 
I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I always thought when I got released, I was going to have this great statement. I was going to make millions from it. It's going to be the title of the book, the movie, everything, you know? I couldn't think of anything to say. I just wanted to be on my own. I couldn't believe it was happening. So the only place I could think of where I could be on my own was the toilet. So the very first thing I say when I got released is, I need a pee. Like, the guy says, yeah, toilet's over there. I'm like, okay. I go into the toilet, I open the door, put my hands on the wall, and I start banging my head on the wall. And like, I've got to stop, 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 stop. You're going to hurt yourself, stop that. Turn around and I wash my face. There's this whole bank of mirrors. Just looking back at myself, I just look at it, and I think, I've done it, I've beaten the odds, I've made it out. Just started crying at that point. Couldn't believe it. So I get out, I go through all these kind of debriefs, I meet a military psychologist, uh, gives me, I give him a load of grief about surviving psychology, the Metropolitan Police are there, all sorts of stuff. Um, I'm in the British Embassy for two days, and I return back, I land back in the UK in the coldest winter in 20 years. I'm not, I've been living in the tropics for the last 10. Um, I return to the UK, meet my family, and I immediately go into 21 days of debrief with SO15, which is the Metropolitan Police Counterterrorism Unit and undergo more psychological checks. I meet the other family members as well. Um, and because it was so cold, I went back to Guyana. Yeah, you know, people say, how did you readjust? The answer is I didn't. I went back to Guyana. I've actually only been back in the UK for about a year. So um, where are they now? So this is the militia that took me hostage, a Seabell hack. This guy over here, he held me hostage for over a year. Um, they're now the biggest fighting force against ISIL. Um, the leader I was exchanged with was democratically elected into the Iraqi government. And, um, yeah, now they're fighting on the same side as the British and the Americans, as they do. So, that's how I sum it up. An interesting cultural experience, but not one that I want to repeat. Um, we've got ten minutes for questions. <laughs> yeah. Great. I'm sure there are lots of questions. So, uh, who wants to go first? No Stop questions. Sounds good for me. <laughs> I mean, after all of that, did you get any compensation from the British government or anyone? No, no. I, so my company got bought out by Deloitte, a financial management company. My division was bought out by Deloitte, and they carried on paying me. And during the time I was a hostage, I got pay rises, promotions, holiday pay, all that sort of thing. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I've often wondered how that went, you know, in the HR assessment, still alive, check, you know, <laughs> like, uh, so I'll get reached, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that kind of thing. So, no, I never got any additional compensation, but I did get, my, like, my salary. I was a salary employee, so I got my continuous salary. And um, when I got released, they wanted me to go to Afghanistan, so I quit the job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, behind you. Uh, hi, Peter. I've actually f heard your talk second time. Um, and um, You got the better one. This, this yeah, was very I compressed. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Uh, so my question is actually like after more than two years, uh, how difficult and, and what was the most difficult thing of getting back into professional IT job back? Yeah, um, I mean, I still say that I'm still readjusting. You know, I went back to South America. I, I cheated. I didn't stay in the UK. I went back to South America. I worked for a little bit in South America, and then I did two years riding a motorcycle around the USA. Then I went back to South America, worked for another couple of years. And then in Guyana, there was a government change last year. So I came back to England after that. Um, and um, yeah, I've not really settled down very well at all, if I'm honest with you. I do bits of jobs. I do these talks. I do IT training predominantly. I like doing training because I get to meet people rather than sitting in a basement doing code. That's quite nice. Um, yeah, um, a difficult, yeah. Ask me again in another year, see, see how things are going with that. <laughs> you know, yeah, sleep's difficult, not good. Yeah, no. yeah. Any more questions? Did you learn the language while you were there? Could you communicate them with them? Yeah, good question. So they, everyone all spoke some English, even if it was just some English words. And I learned some Arabic stuff as well, but it was all a bit weird. I just learned obscure words and slang Arabic and things like Iraqi Macalba, which means Iraqi resistance, you know, just kind of obscure kind of words. I wouldn't say I have a conversation, but I also have, was exposed to Iraqi TV, Arabic TV quite a lot. And I reckon I could understand probably 10% by the time I left. So I, I think that's good enough under the conditions. 
I've forgotten a load of it now. You know, I, it was kind of forced learning, you know what I mean? The, the, the hardest part is, of course, when someone's putting a gun to your face and screaming and shouting you at you in Arabic, you've got no idea what they're saying. I, I don't understand, you know, and they're just getting more frustrated with you and, you know, what do you do, you know? So, you, you know, yeah, it was, it was, it, so there were some interesting situations, shall we say, um, that arose from that. Yeah. I don't know if you can answer this, but do you have a, a rationale or what, why you were treated different to the others? Um, I don't think I was treated differently. I think we were all treated the same, and we all ultimately got split up. Now, the militia tell me that the others were killed because some of them were in a house that um, they thought was being raided by the Americans, and they killed them, but actually they made a mistake. It was the house next door, and they apologized for that. The others were killed because they did try to escape, and they caught them trying to escape, and that's why they killed them. Now, that's what they tell me. Um, now, the people that tell me that were the senior commanders of this militia who were in American prison at the time. So they only know what they've been told. Okay, So, you know, I don't, the answer is I can only tell you what they told me. Right, yeah. But I don't think our treatment was, was any necessarily any different, per se. It certainly wasn't at the start. That's a dead set. For the first six months, it wasn't. Any more questions? Do you think people could have done <clears throat> more to help you? Um, out, you know, the, the company, the government? Yeah, I think, I think, I think the government, definitely. I mean, uh, the, the big problem was there was a logistics problem. You know, we were British civilians, so the Foreign Office were negotiating for us, if you want to put it that way, and they wanted in exchange uh, Iraqis held by the American military. So it was a very big sort of disconnect. Now, in reality, the official line is I got out under the reconciliation process of Iraq where all sides had to release prisoners and enter the political process. So it was part of that reconciliation process that I got released, that America released their prisoners, Britain released their prisoners. So, yeah, I mean, could they have done more? Absolutely. What could they have done? Well, they could have let this guy go two years earlier. But, you know, there was no way America was going to let this militia leader go, um, it, it, you know, because th they were killing Americans. They were killing the Americans. They were against the American military occupation of Iraq, and that's what they were against. If they'd let the leader go, they just would have killed more. So I guess, you know, statistically it was better that they hold us and we die rather than releasing him and probably killing a whole load of American soldiers. I think that's probably the way they saw it. It wasn't good for me. I've got a question because one of the last pictures we saw of uh, that guy who captured you and that now he's officially uh, an ally. Yeah. And I was wondering, do you, do you feel uh, a, a bitter for a better word because of that big politics and, you know, those it, things? Nah, I mean, it, it was out of my control. I mean, it was such a bigger picture. There was nothing I could do with it. Do I think it was a good exchange? Me for this guy, no. Right? Um, you know, IT guy for a militia leader, I don't think it was a good deal. Um, but then again, you know, the government say that he was going to be released regardless, so they may as well release him for something rather than nothing. Nah, you know, depends what kind of political spin you want to put on it. Uh, yeah. right. It looks like we're getting crowded by people coming up from the other talks, okay. so we're I think we'll, we'll end the questions there, though I'm sure if you find Peter propping up the bar, he'd be yeah. more than happy to regale you with more stories. Sure. Um, yeah. But thanks again to Peter for a, a very different talk. <laughs> Thanks. Uh,